Hi, good morning. Uh, back in the church again today. Uh, just me, nobody else. Uh, we're going to worship the Lord together and continue on in John's Gospel and uh, praise the Lord together. So our first song is number 914 in Mission Praise. Number 914, Only by Grace. <laughs> communion service, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this morning, uh, later on, I have communion, and um, what we're going to do now is uh, come to the Lord in prayer. It was a little bit of a rush getting down here this morning, so we're not completely as prepared as we'd like to be. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that uh, we come into your presence by grace, by your mercy. We want to thank you, Lord, that we can be here together to uh, praise you, to worship you. And uh, Lord, we want to thank you that uh, you have shown yourself to be so worthy of worship. Lord, everything you've done has been good. Everything that you say is right. And Lord, your desire for us is good and not harm. So, Lord, we uh, want to thank you together uh, this day. We want to thank you, Lord, for the weather that we've been having recently. Some of us can't sleep. Some of us don't like to be outside. But, Lord, uh, it's better than uh, torrential rain or tornadoes. And, uh, Lord, we're, we're just very grateful for, for what you've given to us. I want to think just for a moment of people around the world who have much less than we do, people who are suffering. Um, tornadoes, people are suffering uh, the blight of mosquitoes and uh, all manner of illnesses and sufferings. Lord, we just uh, pray for them that they would uh, use these things as an opportunity to uh, be prompted to uh, think of you again. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd ease their suffering. Lord, be gracious to them and uh, take these things away. But Lord, we ask that they might indeed be used to draw people to you and uh, as we pray for this virus for us all Lord, might this still be a time when people are calling upon you uh, as they would not have done before lord uh, draw us into your presence we ask and uh, we know that this will be purely by grace in jesus name we ask it amen, amen. 
Amen. All right. I'm going to uh, read from 1 Corinthians 11. Thank you. 1 Corinthians 11 and from verse 17. All right. Paul's writing the letter to the Corinthians. And it's worthwhile saying that uh, he begins his epistle uh, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, their Lord and ours. He's writing to people and he's saying these wonderful things to them, but they are pretty, bo pretty bad. Um, some of the misunderstandings they have are quite large. Uh, some of the things that they're doing morally are very wrong. Uh, and yet he writes to them in this very appealing way, trying to win them over and to bring them back to the place where they should be. And uh, I think maybe that's a, a good example for us, isn't it? Um, it's not good to just condemn the woman caught in adultery, but um, we should be happy if they just go and sin no more. That's what the Lord Jesus was happy with. Well, here's uh, Paul writing to the Corinthians, and now he's telling them about communion or the Lord's Supper. And uh, apparently they didn't have little communion glasses in those days. And they didn't have wafers or nicely cut pieces of bread. Uh, things were a lot more informal. And um, it was regarded as a, a love feast. People brought their own um, foods together. And some people... Um, not to be too rude, they stuffed themselves. And, and other people who didn't have very much, they didn't get to eat very much. And they didn't really wait for each other. <clears throat> and uh, Paul is telling them that's all wrong. If you're going to have communion at uh, one of these uh, meals together, then this is how you do it. And so it's really been helpful to us through the years to, to look at this thing. Um, 1 Corinthians 11. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. Your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God? by humiliating those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So that's what we do together. I'm going to, I trust you're prepared for this. Uh, have some bread and uh, the Lord Jesus had bread and he broke it and he said this is my body and um, it's all for you and uh, it's just bread it's not anything different to normal bread but it's symbolic of the staple food that just about everybody around the world eats and exists and it contributes to their well-being Jesus said uh, in John's Gospel, chapter 6, I believe, I am the bread of life. Well, here we are remembering the bread of uh, the, the body of the Lord Jesus. Just come to the Lord in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Saviour. We thank you that he died for us. Thank you that his body was beaten, that nails were put into him, a sword pierced his side, a crown of thorns was upon his head. He suffered in all these ways physically for us. I want to thank you, Lord, that he did this and uh, he went to this, knowing what was going to happen. Praise you, Lord, for his willingness, his grace to do these things for us. We ask our God that you bless us now as we're, we're remembering the body of the Lord Jesus and what happened to it as we take this breath. Amen.
carry on in 1 Corinthians, um, he carries on. Well, when he'd given thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And you know, it's funny to think, isn't it, that we're proclaiming the Lord's death over this wide area. I don't know how many people are going to be seeing you do it, but that's what we're doing in our hearts. We're proclaiming the Lord's death. He does go on. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why so many of you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined, so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, whenever you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so that when you meet together, it might not result in judgment. And when I come, I'll give further instructions. Well, we, uh, we uh, are together online, which is the best we can do at the moment. And uh, I'm going to um, remember the, 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 the blood of the Lord Jesus that was shed for us to cover over our sins. And um, let's come to the Lord in prayer first. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as, as we think of what Jesus has done, uh, Lord, it does uh, cross our minds uh, the things that we have done and um, the things that uh, Jesus has died for, um, the things that he has been punished for, we are the ones who have done these things. He is the one who has suffered for them. And uh, Lord, we again want to turn away from wrong behavior. We want to turn away from sinful life. And we want to embrace um, what the Lord Jesus has for us. So Lord, we ask once again, you'd accept our thanks for what he has done. And uh, Lord, we ask that you would help us to walk closer to him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now let's drink together and remember his blood. Let's sing our next song, which is number 1217. Number 1217 um, relates to this. <laughs> Just see. 
to the word of God again and uh, we'll read together from John's gospel again we are getting towards the end of this passage and uh, well, uh, in a month or so I'll start reading something else but uh, we're still with John's gospel chapter 1 and the first 14 verses in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, 
came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the rights to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, we're grateful again for the Lord's word. We're going to uh, come to the Lord in prayer. And um, then we'll sing, then we'll think about that passage. Let's, uh, let's come to the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for what we've seen already in your word concerning the Saviour. We want to thank you, Lord, that uh, we've seen that uh, he's always existed. He didn't spring into life. He wasn't created. Father, we thank you that he is one with you, which makes him the perfect person to be our saviour. He is divine, he is holy, and yet also he became a man just like us. The first, the one, the only man without sin. One of us who can pay the price that we would pay, but Lord, who's divine and who could suffer for all people. Lord, we want to thank you that that happened. Thank you. Or for those things we're thinking about in communion. Lord, we want to thank you too that uh, your church is growing in different parts of the world. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we hear of growth in areas of persecution where the church has been set upon and opposed violently uh, by um, kind of an atheistic or perhaps a, a Muslim or uh, some other regime that uh, sets themselves against you, Lord, your children are prospering. And, and we have to say, as we've, um, we've had such an easy ride in the West, we've seen such a waning in your church, such a, a, a turning aside from it. People have not valued you as they should. They have not valued salvation. They have not felt their sin. They have not felt their responsibility but uh, have suppressed it and come up with all kinds of different alternate ideas. And Lord, we, um, we know we're not spiritually richer for it in our affluent society where suicide has never been so prevalent, where people have more and yet uh, we're throwing more away than anyone ever has done in the history of the planet. Lord, we just, uh, we marvel that the signs are so clear and so few are paying attention to them. Uh, Lord, we want to thank you for the Saviour who didn't shun the evil doer, but rather chose to spend time with the tax collectors and sinners. And, and he was known for it and uh, criticised for it. But Lord, we're grateful because that means he would spend time with people like us. We don't feel special uh, unless we think, Lord, that perhaps we've been uh, especially bad. But Lord, we want to thank you that there's forgiveness um, in the Lord Jesus. He came to love us, to forgive us, to bring us to you. And Lord, we want to thank you for the job that he's done. Lord, we do pray that uh, you would bless at this time all those societies are in, uh, who have been engaged in missionary work, uh, who are people who have gone and left their home and gone overseas to serve you and um, we don't really know what's going on and uh, we don't know what they're able to do and uh, what the response would be to that. And we think of people at home who were called by you to look after churches and yet they can't see any of the people that they're supposed to be looking after. Well, we pray that you would help them somehow to do their work and Lord, we pray for people who are engaged in um, the regular work, um, the, the services. We, we want to thank you for policemen, police officers. Lord, we want to thank you for people who are 
trying to keep law and order. Thank you, Lord, for people who are in power, the political parties in power at the, this time. Um, Lord, we just want to ask that uh, you would help them all to, to do their work. Um, pray, Lord, for scientists that they might give wisdom instead of foolishness. We pray, Lord, that um, you would suppress the voices of discontent that seem to be getting loud all the time on more and more subjects. Lord, we pray that there might be peace, there might be a growing contentment. We pray, Lord, knowing that that really only happens in the heart when people give up their sense of rights to their life and surrender to you. Lord, we, uh, we pray that people might um, calm down and that tempers might not be raised so much. Um, Lord, uh, what a world this is, what a world that Jesus came to and who came, who came to die for us. Lord, it's amazing. It's staggering to see that. And uh, we just lift up your name. We want to praise you for your grace, uh, for your mercy. It is only by grace that we have anything. And, and Lord, we ask that uh, we might rejoice in our hearts in a sad time, in a worrisome time. We might be rejoicing people to remember the gifts that you've given to us. Pray for those who are poorly at this time, maybe those who've taken a tumble. We pray for those who are not feeling so good because of their age. We pray for those who are uh, feeling a bit ill, maybe at the moment. Pray for all kinds of different suffering that people might have. And we ask, Lord, especially that uh, you'd be with them at this time, that uh, you'd give them healing, but Lord, that you'd give them encouragement too in you. Um, Lord, we ask that you'd hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We'll sing one more song before um, I speak. And it's going to be number 894, 894. Which is, my Jesus, I love thee.
Well, we're racing through uh, John's Gospel, chapter 1. Uh, this week we're going through verses 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13. How can we embrace so much in one go? Well, very, very carefully. Uh, we're back to talking about Jesus again. Um, we had a little diversion last week from verses 6 to 8 where we were talking about John the Baptist. But uh, if you remember verses 4 and 5, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We're back to talking about Jesus, the light again, because we find ourselves in verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So immediately in that verse, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world we see Jesus distinct from every other light. Because Jesus is the true light, it does suggest that he's not the only light. He's the true one, and there's other ones who are not true. So Jesus is the true light by comparison, and we understand that he gives light to everyone by generalization. So Jesus, the true light by comparison, comparing him to the false lights, gives light to everyone by generalization. Um, there are those all around the world who receive his light, and um, there are plenty of people who actually ignore it, and that's uh, what the rest of this particular passage is, uh, is about. Uh, some ignore him and walk in darkness, some give him some attention, and their lives are better for it. Uh, some take joy in him, and you might almost say they need spiritual sunglasses because he's the one that they dwell on, gaze on, and take delight in the very most of all. So there's a difference, isn't there, between ignoring him, taking notice of him, and focusing in on him. The true light that gives light to everyone is coming into the world. Well, all of this serves as an introduction to these uh, verses that we have today verses 9 to uh, 13. They give more detail, but this, verse 9, is their theme. And, uh, well, just to make it easier to sort of get through and to sort of know where you are in the passage, uh, I'm going to give you three words, three words that are actually here uh, in the passage. And they're not mine. They're, they're coming from John himself. And uh, he wrote, recognize, receive, and write. Okay, you might even... They're really astute. You might even recognize off the top of your head which verses they come from, their context. Recognize, receive, and write. So we're going to think about that first word, recognize. Um, the other night, um, I couldn't sleep. And I don't know, I think maybe there might be quite a few of you at the moment who just can't sleep at the moment because it's really, really hot. So uh, I came downstairs at 1 o'clock. I was sleeping. I woke up and I couldn't get to sleep again. So I came downstairs at one o'clock in the morning and um, I was going to come down into the lounge. I went into the lounge, but I couldn't see anything. Uh, so I knew I was going to have to turn the light on. But maybe you've had that experience as well. At one o'clock in the morning, what you don't really want to do is to have the full lights on in the room because they're really going to do your eyes in. Somewhere in there, we've got this standard lamp that I could have turned on, but I couldn't find it because it was dark. So I had to turn the eyes on and turn the light on and the light went on and it hurt my eyes. And uh, that's kind of an image of the world as it is with the, the Lord Jesus coming along. Um, we've seen verse 9. In verse 10, he was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not uh, recognize him. The world did not recognize him. Think of the world. Think of the darkness in the world. Think of what that darkness actually is. It's a selfishness of mankind. Um, uh, you know, I want this, I want that. And so, well, these are conflicting desires, so we, we argue about it. And it, uh, it happens just personally. It happens sometimes in families, sometimes it can happen locally. Uh, in council, we're hearing all about different council meetings at different times in different places. And it happens nationally as well, even internationally. Selfishness, it comes down to selfishness. Uh, rebellion, uh, classic rebellion stories in the Old Testament against Moses by the children of Israel going through the desert, family troubles that people have, cruelty, 
I've been hearing awful stories of cruelty against animals uh, this week. All of this darkness that's in the world today. So here it is, a world of darkness. Isn't it unthinkable that in this old dark world, a light would come um, and what verse call, what verse 4 calls the light of men and people wouldn't notice it. In a, a world of darkness, suddenly there's the light of men and people wouldn't even see it? Well, I don't know that that would happen, really. We had a plane fly over the other day. Uh, I'm guessing it was a plane. Actually, for me, it was a UFO because I didn't see it. It was unidentified. But it was over the top of my head, so it was flying. Anyway, I'm going to guess it was a plane. So a plane flew over the other day, and it must have been absolutely humongous. It must have been huge. But I don't know because I didn't see it. I heard it because it was absolutely deafening, and I felt it because even the house was vibrating. How does that happen that there's a plane that you don't even can't even see is there, and everybody is feeling it and hearing it? It was a strange thing. I couldn't see anything in the sky. Went out to have a look, expecting to see this massive thing, and there was nothing there. Couldn't even see it. Even though I couldn't see it, I felt it, and certainly heard all about it. It was like a sound coming from nowhere. Jesus came to shepherds. He came to wise men and was worshipped. And he got back to Nazareth, his hometown. He was largely ignored. Matthew 13, 54-57. Coming to his hometown in his public ministry of three years, he began teaching the people in their synagogue and they were amazed. Where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? When then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. Matthew 13, 54 to 57. Now that's got something to do with familiarity. People looked at Jesus and they thought that they knew him and they thought they were very familiar with him and all of a sudden they're being asked to expect, uh, asked to accept him as the saviour of the world. And they couldn't picture this young man they knew as the long-looked-for Messiah. But as he spoke to them, shouldn't they have listened? Shouldn't they have taken some notice to see what he was actually saying? Nazareth is only the same as the majority of other people who have heard Christ's teaching. John says, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Of course, at the time, not everyone in the whole world had literally heard him. This speaks generally of all kinds of listeners in all kinds of situations, although all the people were made from him. Uh, all the different people did not recognize him. Uh, those in synagogues, those who were in fields, people he spoke to in marketplaces, people he spoke to on mountainside. Jesus made all of those places. He made the hillsides. He made the flat places where people could stick a marketplace. He made all of these places, but they didn't, who were there, they didn't identify him with the role of maker and ruler. Why not? Well, I've been hearing a lot about Bear Grylls recently and uh, the adventurer, the explorer. So I thought I'd look up Bear Grylls on Wikipedia this week because I'd heard that he's a born-again Christian and that he did some Christian speaking and he had written uh, Christian books, um, Bible study, daily reading books. And uh, so looking on his Wikipedia page, which is quite a long page, all I saw of a spiritual nature was that he was an Anglican. That's it. He said, uh, it said on there, Bear, Grill, Bear Grylls is an Anglican and his faith is like the backbone of his life, he said. That's what. That's it. That's the complete thing. Now, Mr. Grylls probably had nothing to do with the construction of this Wikipedia page, but it's interesting that those who took the trouble found the subject of his faith a little touchy to dwell upon. I guess it's the same reason that we all know 
that we get a different response if we talk to someone about God. Okay. But if we talk about Jesus, oh, talk about God. Everyone talks about God. Talk about Jesus. Well, and that kind of nails things down a bit, doesn't it? And it sort of verges, is going in the direction of a personal accountability or even a hint of personal accountability. Jesus suffered and died because of our sin. I mean, we know that and nobody really wants to think about my accountability before God. Feel free, free to talk about your truth, uh, but don't for a moment think I'll ever make it my truth. You know, that's okay for you, but uh, it's not ever going to be objective truth to me. The world didn't recognize the one to whom they were accountable. They saw the healer, they listened to the teacher, and even if they didn't understand it all, they listened, but what they didn't want to hear about was that he, what he had come to do and why they needed him to do it. In fact, when he told the disciples that he's, going, he's come to the earth to die for people, uh, Peter said, no, Lord. Contradiction in terms, isn't it, saying no, Lord. Well, that's recognised. You know, this is a world that really has not recognised the Lord Jesus. Uh, even today, the world largely has not recognised him as, as they should have done. Um, but uh, things progress. And, and in verse 11, we've got the word receive. Um, verse 11 says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And one great Bible writer who writes, uh, writes about the Bible, William Hendrickson, he offers a slightly different translation of the two words that we've got here, recognize and receive. He offers acknowledge and welcome, based on a lot of scholarly knowledge. Uh, acknowledge and welcome. Jesus came into the world, but people didn't buy into the evidence of their eyes. They refused to recognize Jesus as divine. And because they didn't accept his divinity, they did not receive him as he truly is and didn't welcome him for what he is. So these two things are quite similar, but one thing kind of leads on uh, to another. Here's the strange situation. Jesus made the world. Uh, when he takes on humanity and, um, and he walks amongst the creation, amongst the creation he's made, no one actually sees that he is the creator. He's done such a good job of becoming one of us. People actually can't see past the fact that he is one of us. This is basically what verse 11 is saying. saying only we can take on a little more meaning than that. When we think of his own, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. We don't have to limit ourselves to a broad picture of the whole of creation. Uh, John was actually writing to a particular people. Uh, Jesus was born Jewish and he ministered almost exclusively amongst Jewish people and their response to what he had to say was confusion, interest, moving to disinterest, rejection, ultimately betrayal and anger. Well, you know the history um, of history, the history of Israel. The Lord spoke to Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, and kept on with Israel, even in the desert for 40 years. And once they got to the promised land, they were unfaithful to him. In every way, Israel was Jesus's very own. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And uh, as often we, goes throughout their history, they didn't actually even want to know him. And they didn't know, want to know anything about him. He's the creator that they didn't need. He's the protector that they didn't want. He's the husband they were unfaithful to. The physician they'd turn away from in favour of further illness. He's the world famous concert pianist that they'd turn off in favour of a concerto knocked out on a pair of finger symbols. They don't want the big thing. 
they would rather have the small, trivial, ultimately the worthless. Israel didn't just need the Lord Jesus because he was the one always promised to be the Messiah, but they needed a saviour from sin, as we all still do today. So Jesus came to the Jews, they rejected him. He came to the Gentiles, and many Gentiles have rejected him too. And yet Jesus still is here. And the good news is, in the last word, which is right with... Um, the word right it's not right in the sense of uh, being opposite to wrong um, or being correct uh, it's right in the sense of entitlement he had a right to this uh, and what a right we have here in verse 12 um, to all who did receive him to those who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of god he gave the right to become children of God. Two things to say about this verse. The condition and the consequence. The condition. This isn't something valueless. That's um, to become children of God. It's not something valueless. That's just handed out to all comers. But to all who did receive him. To those who believed in his name. We're told. Now according to what we've seen already. That excludes just about everyone um, certainly um, in Israel we read in verse 10 and 11 he was in the world and though the world was made through him the world did not recognize him he came to that which was his own but his own did not receive him certainly Israel at that time were not wanting their savior at all but looking in the gospels there were people even in Israel who did accept him they received him, took him into their hearts and their lives, and they welcomed him, welcomed him into their day and involved him in the day-to-day -day living that they're going through. So as they did what they did, it wasn't just that they were doing it, they were doing it with the Lord Jesus. I saw someone send something back to Amazon yesterday, and they had it all packed up, neatly in a cardboard box and you can't really believe Jesus into a box you can't put sellotape around the outside and keep him in you can't contain him and insist he must be what you want him to be he is the scripture says the king of kings the king of kings isn't dependent <clears throat> on our permission to be whatever he wants to be. He is the shepherd, not you. You're the sheep, he's the shepherd. So when he calls us out about our sins and he tells us, we can't be pretending he's getting it wrong. We can't say, well, you know, I'm not that bad. Jesus says, I've come to die for your sins. You can't respond with the classic, but I don't have any sins. I've never done anything wrong. He knows a bit better than we do. He's the shepherd. He's the king of kings. We're just us. Every sin has been paid for. So all that remains to do is to confess them to him. To say to him, Lord, I know I did that. And what's brilliant is I know that you've died. And you've forgiven me for it. Lord, I definitely don't want to do that again. Lord, I've done this. But Lord, I, I wish I didn't do it. I know I did. But I know you've forgiven me. How great are you that you would actually forgive me for even doing that. Lord, you are so good. Every sin paid for. Embrace his full forgiveness. And don't try and live up to something because... The standard that we've got to live up to is absolute perfection and we're not going to make it. So just let him carry the weight for you. He's already done it. So anyway, that's that's one thing. And, and then there's the consequence of it. Um, to those who accept him and believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The consequence of that, um, he gave the right to become children of God. Now he's not saying that God gave us the right to play with toys on the floor in the house. 
or the right to climb the trees in the back garden. But we can be children of God. Or even, oh, do you remember the, uh, the highly significant time when the, one of the children finally gets to use the remote control? Dad snatches it back very quickly. Yeah, he gives us the right to be his children, not in the sense of indulging us playfully as we stumble from one mistake to another. Um, the consequences of sonship are a lot deeper than that. This kind of sonship actually gives us the qualities of the nature of the father. Being a part of his adopted family, we grow to become like him. And being adopted into a family means that the, God's characteristics are not naturally ours. They're not in our DNA. They're not what make us what we are. But living with him, submitting to him, being there in his family, his adoptive family, we do become more like him. We are influenced by him and we, come, we become much more God-like. Uh, we go to him and he completes the process. Uh, we don't uh, develop uh, supernatural powers and uh, those kind of things. We're talking about the character of God. We become full of love. We become full of unselfishness. We become full of goodness and kindness. All those things you admire in God, the sons of God in his family, develop these characteristics themselves. is isn't something that you can just naturally grow into anyway. This is a, a new life, a fresh approach at living. And you can see how it happens. Um, Ephesians 1 verse 5 says, He predestined us. That means he, um, he arranged that this would happen way before it did happen. He, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. This actually doesn't even start with us and we hear the words of Jesus and we think yeah I think yeah I'm going to commit myself to that it even begins before that all of this happens according to his pleasure and his will his desire for us and his grace to us he decides to do it his idea his authority his say so so it would be right to vigorously defend God's decision-making power in the area of adoption and any form of spiritual blessing. We go forward in him because of him. We grow in him. We mature because of him and we become more Christ-like because of him. We can't change the order from being the supplicant begging blessing to an authoritarian master demanding God does as we say. We don't have words of authority that command the power of God. We don't have anything. We are the, uh, well, as a long time ago, people described preaching in this way. They said, a preacher is one beggar telling other beggars where they can find bread. That's what preaching is. That's what the Christian life is. Uh, we're not the, the kings on the throne. That is, there is only one king. We are here looking to him. So the light of the world comes into the world and it's the same for everyone. It's the same, it's the same light. It's not UV for some and a floodlight for other people. It's, it's a light of understanding. It's the light of conscience. Uh, it's the light of warm, embracing love. Um, this is the light that the Lord is bringing in. Some reject it because they prefer not to look. Uh, sure, they're going to be uncomfortable and disturbed. Actually, they will be blessedly disturbed. We need disturbing. Otherwise, we carry on the path we've always been on, which is the road to nowhere. We need to get off that and go on the path toward heaven, uh, the path that the Lord has set out. Some people welcome the light as they find that it explains everything they thought they understood, but now they realize that they missed. Some people welcome the light, but some people welcome the light because it does expose the darkness of the human heart. And rather than just leaving us morose and miserable and regretful of past things, 
Instead of that, it fills it with God's light instead. So you can ignore God's light. You can appreciate it and maybe be a better person because you take notice of it. Or you can actually open up and let it flood you whole inside. And when you let God's light flood you all inside, you'll be asking him, what do you want to tell me about myself? What do you want to tell me about following you? How does that work? And I hope that's you because that's what God does. He will help you in every way. We're going to sing our last song, which is number 445, 445. 445. Okay. Just going to fetch another book.
Well, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just uh, want to thank you for the light of the world, and uh, we thank you that it's still shining today, and uh, all the world's still dark today, so we still need him. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you continue to shine in our hearts. Tell us where we're going wrong, we pray, and uh, lead us into your truth. We thank you for the Bible, which is our guide to truth. Help us to pay attention to it, to follow what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, good to be with you this week, and um, hope to see you on when our Bible study is, which is um, found on Facebook. But for now, goodbye. God bless you.